going to talk about the kingdom of God. Why are we talking about it? Because you're supposed to be seeking it. You're supposed to be seeking the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. That's a pretty broad subject in this world today. It always has been in other worlds. And we need to take a close look at how closely we are seeking the kingdom and the righteousness of God. There are lots of unrighteousness going on in the world today. People are taking a bite out of one another. They are eating each other up. If you look in the Bible, there is actually talking about making a city uh, and we be the flesh. Uh, what are they talking about when they make these statements? in the Bible, of the city being the cauldron and we be the flesh. Let us build us a house. This city is the cauldron and we be the flesh. Ezekiel 11.3 We are told not to do that. We are told that that's a bad thing. Uh, we also know that the Israelites, when they left Egypt, they became discontent at one time and said that they wanted to be back in Egypt and eat from the flesh pot of Egypt. Well, if you don't understand the language of the time and the metaphors that are just constantly a part of the Hebrew language, you may miss a great deal of that. If you have ministers who are not really preaching the gospel of the kingdom and are preaching some sort of other watered-down version of the gospel of the kingdom, then you are not going to understand what they're talking about. In Micah, they talk about who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. Again, what are they talking about in Micah 3 3? This city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst thereof, but I will judge in the border of Israel. In the border of Israel, the city is the cauldron, you be the flesh people eating from one another, chopping their bones up. That doesn't go on anymore, does it? Or does it? Actually, it does. It goes on all the time. It goes on every day, everywhere in the world today. Now, there are pockets throughout the world where people don't do that, but they are very limited areas, and they are very limited groups of people a small minority of people. And what am I talking about? What, what, what is this message of the cauldron? It is a common purse. It is the temptation that has come from the day Cain went out of the presence of God and said that he was going to create his own world, his own government, his own system, separate from God, contrary to God, doing his own thing. Now, Cain was doing this, and this is a bad thing, but we're not doing that today, are we? Uh, are we also doing what Cain did? Are we going out of the presence of God and making our own system. If you read in Proverbs 1, uh, you'll find uh, some interesting statements made. Uh, let's go back up to uh, Proverbs at the very beginning. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words 
of understanding to perceive the instructions of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel to understand Proverbs and the interpretation, the words of the wise, and their dark saying. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother for they shall be an ornament of grace unto the head and chains about thy neck. Now he talks about the law of thy mother and forsake not that law and the instruction of thy father. Now Proverbs actually uh, mentions women probably more than any other but the woman that they are talking about is a metaphor for woman, for something else where it has to do with kind of the father and mother of our spiritual existence. We know the father is in heaven, uh, but is there a mother in heaven also? Well, not really, not in the sense that we think, but as a metaphor, this has been used to express Something in the aspect of God's revelation to man, the wisdom, the understanding. Uh, the idea of motherhood has to do with uh, a woman impregnated by the father, uh, by a genetic pattern of the father, and she produces something that is unique by that intercourse. Using that concept as a metaphor, we talk about creating the kingdom of God and, and wisdom and uh, understanding. But when we get down to Proverbs 8, it says, My sons, hear the instructions of the Father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Again, they're not talking about we could create, a, uh, personify a father and mother in heaven and that God has a wife and all this kind of stuff. But that's not the purpose of the statement. They're using the concepts as metaphors to express an idea so that you can understand something that is spiritual. It's very difficult to give you understanding of spiritual things by talking about physical things. And the reality is you can't really understand spiritual things by, under, by comprehending physical metaphors or descriptions in words. Because the spirit comes first. It's more complete. It's, it, you cannot, it, it is infinite while the physical realm is finite. And you cannot describe perfectly the infinite with the finite. So words will always fall short when it comes to enlightening you uh, with a spiritual understanding. But words can still be used as a tool to kind of sweep away the dirt that we accumulate in our own house so that we can see things more clearly. Life will also do this. The winds of life, the difficulties of life, I'm using metaphors here so you can see how this uh, operates, uh, can blow away uh, a lot of the debris that accumulates in our hearts and our minds. We accept a lot of ideas and we go about life as if those ideas are God. And the reality is those ideas and philosophies are not God. And then if we worship those ideas and philosophies, we will become dictatorial, uh, doctrinal, or dogmatic, uh, pharisaical uh, individuals who impose our beliefs, our intellectual beliefs, our theologies upon other people. Christ didn't come here to create a theology that you could memorize and impose on somebody else. He came to teach you a way, a spiritual way of existing. Can people make you angry? If they can, you are a subject. 
you are a slave. But the presence of people can drive you away, uh, can make you change where you're going. Uh, then you are a slave to the presence of those individuals. They control you. They manipulate your action. Uh, the devil can use that against you to make you do anything he wants if what others do and believe can alter what you're going to do and believe. When we get to verse 10, it says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Now this is right in the beginning of Proverbs that's going to teach you wisdom and and uh, give you knowledge and discretion, uh, the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. What are they talking about? Aren't we talking about spiritual things? Yet here we see them talking about judgment, justice, and equity. The word equity there is... Uh, the Mim Yad Shem, uh, Rish, Hebrew word, uh, it comes, uh, another Hebrew word, Yad Shem, Rish, which means please, straight, direct, right, well, fitted, good, make straight, <laughs> and all, it's translated all those different ways, to be right, to be straight, to be level, that's what it means. But here we have an extra mem on the front. Mem always has to do with flowing, uh, energy, um, a utility, uh, water, love. Whenever you see that mem, that, that's what they're trying to impart. So they've added a mem to a three-letter Hebrew word. All Hebrew words are basically three letters. Three concepts brought together to create an idea, and we call that idea a word. It is translated numerous different ways. Equity, uprightly, uh, uh, uprightness, right thing, agreement. All right, equal, uh, righteously, sweetly. <laughs> yeah, it's even translated sweetly. So that word, equity, is uh, kind of an interesting word to put there when they're talking about instruction and uprightness. Well, that's important to us because of the fact that we're supposed to be seeking the kingdom of God and his uprightness, his righteousness. The other thing that Proverbs is supposed to be telling us about is justice. Because that's the, the word we see directly before that. Well, that's from another three-letter word in the Hebrew language, which is translated 77 times as righteous, 11 times as just, 10 times as justice, 8 times as righteous, 3 times as righteously, one time, uh, 3 times as right and righteous cause one time, unrighteousness one time. Uh... Now, it's interesting that it's translated unrighteous one time. That's not unrighteous in relationship to another word. That is just, it's just they decided that they're going to translate it unrighteousness in this one place. <laughs> and, and it's defined as righteousness in government. And of course, God is always preaching his government. And Cain is always preaching his government. Cain's government is outside of the presence of God and therefore is not a righteous government. It may be a legal government. It may be a binding government. Remember, whenever we use the word legal, that comes from lex legere, meaning to bind. So you may be bound in an unrighteous system, and you want to get out from that system. You could only do it by becoming bound to righteousness. That is why Jesus, who came as the only begotten Son of the Father, for the purposes that the world might be saved, says to seek the kingdom, which is a process, and the righteousness of God. So we'll go back here in Proverbs trying to figure out what the righteousness of God. 
Now, we know it's not right that we make a city a cauldron and we be the flesh and do eat freely from. We know that because it's repeated over and over again in the Bible. And all your ministers in your churches are reminding you of that, that you would not consent to such a system because it would be going out of the presence of God. Oh, you're telling me that your ministers are not mentioning this in your churches? <laughs> then you've got the wrong ministers. You need to wake them up. You need to rattle their cage. I was recently at a, a group of ministers uh, here in the local area, came together looking to re-examine their positions, uh, their own understanding of the nature of the church. And uh, they actually invited me down. I was down there for near eight hours uh, talking about the nature of the church as I have discovered it to be uh, by the grace of God because I would not have known this except by the grace of God. Uh, I give him all the credit of everything that I know and because he freely gave it to me, undeserving as I am, too. Someone wrote just before, or I read their email just before the program, I was going through all the numerous emails we get, uh, that they wanted to start a church, and they wanted to know if we had such information available. Well, of course, it is available on the website. It's holychurch.info uh, is the one we recommend you go to first. It's very easy to start a church. He asked about, uh, are the contributions to the church tax deductible? Well, of course they are. Uh, do we have to go to the government to get permission to do that? And of course you don't. Uh, at least here in the United States, there is no requirement that the church file. As a matter of fact, the church is mandatorily, quote, mandatorily accepted from having to file. The churches go down and do, and when they do, they waive a right. This is one of the things that we're talking about. They give up their right, granted to them by Christ and the Father, and they go under the authority of the rulers of the world. But Jesus' kingdom is not a part of the world, so therefore, why are they doing it? They are literally making the church a part of the world. As soon as you do that, it ceases being the church by the words of the world. If you incorporate under the authority of the world, the state, the state of, then all other previous incorporation by Christ is as if it never happened. Yet churches are running out and incorporating. Read Body of Christ versus Body of the State. Uh, available for free on the net, or read uh, the Free Church Report, or read uh, the Covenants of the Gods, the last chapter, is the is that same pamphlet that you see, with a little bit more added in. The pamphlets are reduced down to 12 pages for easy reading, but it's clear in there. So how does the church organize? Well, it has to go back to Jesus. It does not become a flesh pot. Well, we can take bites out of one another. It is operating by faith, hope, and charity in the perfect law of liberty. As a matter of fact, you cannot even consent to entering into uh, the congregation of the people except on a day-by-day -day basis. You don't never belong to the church as a member of a congregation. We want you to belong. We want your heart and your mind to belong to God, not to us. So Proverbs goes on to say, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us look privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance we house with spoil. And what are they talking about? These are metaphors again. But they are talking about consent. That's not a metaphor. That's a reality. Wait for blood. What is the blood? Blood of your sacrifice. The sacrifice you make every day 
for God. Isn't, isn't that that blood sacrifice? A lot of people, huge amount of theology is created around the idea that Abraham and Moses were told to put the throat of sheep, lay them on piles of stone, and set them on fire. If you read Thy Kingdom Come or Artifice and Language Land, the, uh, the sophistry of sacrifice, you will see that that was next. God was asking of you. Yes, he wanted you to sacrifice your blood on an individual basis. Every time you work and earn something, I was out cutting wood for uh, to accumulate wood, firewood for neighbors who may find themselves short once the mountains are filled with snow. We have enough firewood for ourselves, but uh, sometimes people, there's uh, widows in the area who don't have enough wood to get them through. Well, we want to have an extra stockpile so that we will be there for them and be able to help them. So we went down and, and we went up into the woods and cut eight cords of wood and brought it down, piled it up. During that, a log shifted once, came back and hit me in the wrist, uh, in the back of the wrist and scraped off a large chunk of skin and, and bled. So that blood was my sacrifice for that day to help out the needy of our community. Every time you work, you're giving, your heart is pounding, your blood is passing through your veins uh, with that mem, that flow of energy. You're sacrificing that up to obtain what you're going to obtain from the fruit of that work. If you're taking a portion of that work and giving it away, Freely giving it away to others, completely giving it away so it's no longer yours. That is a burnt blood, your blood. If you're a sheep herder and you take a sheep and you give it away to the poor, that is your burnt offering, given away to the poor. That is what they're talking about in the metaphors of the Bible. They're not talking about blowing smoke up in the air from setting a sheep on fire. You ever burn a sheep? <laughs> on a pile of rocks. We got a video of that. <laughs> it is not a pleasing sight, nor does it make a pleasing sense. Those are metaphors. The pile of rocks is a it is a gathering of men. That the same words in Hebrew mean the same thing. The kidneys. That means the reins of control. Same exact word in the Hebrew. For reins of control is the same exact word for kidneys. So you, you have to understand these are metaphors trying to show you how the kingdom works, how the government of God works through faith, hope, and charity and the perfect law of liberty. We're talking about flesh pots, common purses, consenting, entering into the city of Cain, the city of Nimrod, the city of Pharaoh, the bondage of Pharaoh, the... the uh, wicked systems of the world that actually can serve God as wicked as they are and out of the presence of God. They are there to punish the wicked. Who are the wicked? The slothful. And the slothful shall be under tribute. Another quote from Proverbs. But we were talking about in Proverbs 1, way back at the beginning, where it talks about teaching us about justice and equity. My son of sinners enticed the consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, the blood of your neighbor. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. The innocent without cause. How, how are we taking the blood of the innocent without cause, without just cause? How are we killing them, biting them, breaking their bones? Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. That's making people your slave where you can force them to labor on your behalf, sweat their sweat, bleed their blood for you. Every heartbeat that they give for part of the day will be given to you. How do we do that? How do we swallow them up? We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our house with spoils. 
uh, verse 14 goes on to say, Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. They're talking socialism, communism. They're talking about having this everything in common in a system that exercises authority, that forces the contribution of the people. Remember when Saul forced the contribution of the people, that was why his kingdom was not going to stand. If people entice you to do that, and they already have, and you've done that, and you already have, where they can take 20, 30, 40, 50% of your labor from you every day. There, there's a case going up, uh, I think Hendrickson is the name of the guy who cracked the code, uh, going on trial and he's saying that he, he doesn't owe any income tax because he's not a federal employee. Well, I don't know all the details, I don't follow the, the exactly what he's doing, but I've read this stuff in the past. And, and there's actually a $10,000 reward out for anybody who can prove why, you know, the average U.S. citizen would owe an income tax because they say it's not in the code. You know, and there are people going to jail all the time because they actually believe that it's not in the code. Well, the, the answer is obvious. I mean, it's so obvious, it, it is staggering to my imagination why these people are not getting it. Show me the law. I'll show you the law. Very simple. You agreed to it. You said, let us all have one purse. Yeah. That's what you said. You said, let us sneakily, privately, <laughs> cleverly, without cause, let us lay in wait for the blood of our neighbors. Let's swallow our neighbors up like the grave. That's what you said. That's what you've done. Let's cast in our lot and have this one purse. All these guys, not all of them maybe, but an awful lot of them, they've got a social security number. They are absolutely content. You don't pay into social security like an insurance. It's not insurance. Read the book by the guy who wrote the social security program. It was sold as if it was insurance. It's not insurance. It's a mutual surety. You're paying in, not for you and the future. You're paying in for the widows and orphans and needy of your society today. That is your sacrifice. That is the sacrifice you are making on your altar. Social Security is a religious system. It's the way in which you take care of your society. It is not a pure system because it is run by men who call themselves benefactors but exercise authority one over the other. And if you're participating in that system, you are not following Christ. If you are not following Christ, you are not a Christian. If you are saying Lord, Lord in your church, you remain an unbeliever because you're not living by faith, hope, and charity. You're living by the force and fear and compulsion that is coming down from men who call themselves benefactors but are forcing your neighbor, biting out of your neighbor, taking a chunk of your neighbor's flesh for you. You, you, you. you don't think you're doing that? Well, certainly you're doing that. You've got free school education, didn't you? You went to public school. You've already bitten out of your neighbor. You forced your neighbor to come pay for your public education. You didn't have to do that. You could have gone to private school. You could have a uh, home taught you could have got together in your congregations and made arrangements to have even a better education but now you're sitting there complaining oh they took the bible out of the public schools well you took you left the bible behind when you set up public schools or you force your neighbor to pay for your child's education shame on you didn't your pastors tell you that you're not supposed to covet your neighbor's goods didn't he read Proverbs that you were not to cast in your lot and have one purse so that you may gain a free education? 
15, verse 15 says, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Yet they are captured in the net. There it was right there. Let's have public education. Let's force our neighbor to taxation to pay for our school, for our swimming pool, for our sports program. Let's do that. How could any Christian, any Jew, believe that's a good thing if they had read Proverbs? They want to eat from the flesh pot. They want to be the flesh. They figure they're going to get a bigger portion. They're going to get the big chunk of meat. And unfortunately, they become the chunk of meat. And then they whine about it and cry about it. What was us? Well, what was your neighbor when you were biting out of him? Getting your free education at his expense. How can you call yourself Christians and do that? Repent. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And the righteousness of God. And the justice of God and the mercy of God. If you're going to not have justice and mercy for your neighbor, if you're going to bite out of him, then figure on being bit yourself. If you're going to net him in your common purse, your one purse, then then you're going to be caught too. I mean, the net was there. You constructed the net yourself. And they lay in wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy for gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof, your neighbors. You have been coveting your neighbor's goods and taking away their life. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her from the street. She again, wisdom. There's that woman. She crieth in the chief places of concourse, in the openings of the gates in the city. She uttereth her words. Saying, how long, you simple one, will you love simplicity? Oh, it's so simple to put your kids on that yellow bus and send them off to school at the expense of their neighbor. It's so simple to go down and get the check that will come to you in your mail. Instant deposit at the expense of your neighbor. Are you living by faith, hope, and church? Who is buying your daily bread? I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying get rid of your social security numbers. You can't just throw them away. You're a surety for debt. There is a plan laid out very carefully by Christ, by Moses, by Abraham. You have to construct your altars of faith and start taking care of one another. If you see what I'm talking about, you need to contribute to that effort. You, you can contribute by sending us something, sure. But you don't have to send us anything to contribute to God's plan, to God's kingdom. You can come together in the network. We have a network set up. Go to the website, hisholychurch.info. Join the network in your area. Whether you're in New Zealand or Australia, join that network. Get to know those people. Mark in Australia. George in New Zealand. David, Canada. Paul in Wisconsin. Get to know these people. Get to know each other. Start networking. Start not biting out of one another, but caring for one another. Start forming congregations based on faith, hope, and charity. You've got a congregation based on force, fear, and violence. It's called the government. It is not the only government. Christ gave you a government too, but you have to contribute to it. You have to lay a part of your heartbeat today on that altar and give it away, freely give it away to someone else, anyone else, for the purposes of manifesting the mem, the flow of God's life through you to others. 
And as you do that, as you freely receive heartbeats today from God's grace, you must freely give away heartbeats today for God's grace. Freely give them away to others and support the kingdom of God which is at hand so that it may support you. Cast your bread upon the water so it may come back to you. This is the message. It's not about waving your hands in church. It's not about singing songs in church. It's about the harmony with God. Do harmony with your fellow man. Now there is a common person in the church, but that is men who voluntarily come together and become your ministers. They hold all things in common because they become a part of the estate of God. Someone studying government just the other day realized that a government doesn't necessarily have to have a territory. Kingdom of Heaven is not a place. You are territory. You're made of dirt. Living, walking, breathing dirt. Some of you may be stones. You need to become the stone altars of God by coming together in one accord, fitting together to humility and patience and forgiveness. And become that church that provides that one form of government holding all things in common so that we may go in and out the gate and set men free but we can't make you free the same as Jesus can't make you free he didn't come here to make you free he came that you might be free you are forgiven as you forgive others forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others if you're not forgiving others, if you're not coming together with patience and hope and love, then don't figure on finding Christ. Someone wrote just before the program, how do you form a church? A free church. Well, we have a whole book on that. It's available on the net. All the information is there on the net. Go to hisholychurch.info, go to the outline page, go down there and look for the church packet. That's the start. All the articles that are on the Free Church Report are in in there. I, have, I haven't got them up in HTML series yet, but they're there. We, we make it so you have to do a little searching. A little searching. But if you join the network, there will be people that will help steer, your, what, steer you on your way because they are already on that way. They can show you where the pitfalls are. And I will make myself available to those personal contact ministers on that network. Now, someone called me last night uh, because of local corruption. Actually, it's in a nearby county. I've known about the corruption. I mean, the head of uh, uh, judges in the county, police officers in the county, DA in the county are all part of the uh, drug cartel that is bringing in huge amounts of drugs into the state of Oregon and disseminating them throughout Oregon from this one county. Uh, FBI's gone in there. They say they can't do anything because everything is shut down. Now, I knew FBI agents when I was a boy. Uh, they can do something if they have the will to do it. They could put an end to that, uh, drug cartel. It, it would be, they have become so bold, so blatant, uh, that, uh, they would be easy to capture. I mean, everybody I know in Klamath, everybody, some people are pretty naive. Uh, they, they know where they, they do all their work, dirty work. Nobody does anything about it. I know the answer to all that kind of corruption, which I find in, in different states all over the United States, and, and I'm sure they're in Australia and New Zealand and Canada as well. And, and I know they're in the South American countries. The answer is the kingdom. You have to come together and start caring about one another. You have to have a common purse of love, not a common purse of contract that binds you up and make you a piece of merchandise, a human resource to be uh, milked of your milk and honey and even the blood itself. 
who can take your children away and do what they want with them. It is absolutely amazing all the warning given by God to Samuel to give to the people when the voice of the people cried out for a leader. Our law today in almost every country throughout the world You need to become a part of this. You need to start contributing to the kingdom if you want to be a part of the kingdom. No one's going to put you in a flesh pot and boil you up and bite out of you. You must choose to contribute to that kingdom by contributing to one another. You cannot contribute to one another unless you find one another. We've started a number of forums on each of these local areas, the Indiana group, California group, the different states and as states become uh, more populated with people seeking the kingdom we will divide them off but we will keep them linked to their personal contact ministry you get on those groups you need to pick a personal contact minister so that you will get the living network newsletter and and we would be doing a whole lot more if we could get your support but that's up to you We work for Christ. If Christ puts it on your heart to support us, go ahead and do so. If he doesn't, don't worry about it. But I know that he's putting something on your heart about contributing to somebody else besides yourself. It is in the nature of God to give. He gave you life. You need to turn around and give life to others. If you're not doing that, you're not living according to the character of God, you will be deceived, you will be suckered into these nets, these cauldrons, and you will be devoured. If you take on the character of Christ, the character of the Father, and start giving up your life, you will have life more abundant. This is what Christ said. Figure it out. You need to be contributing to others. Now, you, everybody out there is probably contributing to others, whether they like it or not. I mean, there's a few rebels running around in the cracks of the system saying, oh, we're free, we're free, we're a bunch of sovereigns. But if you're not contributing to others, you're not sovereigns, you're just sneaking around. The only sovereignty is in God. And the way to obtain the sovereignty of God is to become like God and live in accordance to his image. He is a life giver. He is a bestower of gifts upon you and all of mankind. If you are not following in that character, you don't have anything to do with it and you've gone out of the present. You'd be better off in the system of men to take the bite out of one another. But that's where you deserve to be. You aren't diligent in seeking the righteousness of God. You are not diligent in conforming to the character of God. And therefore, you're, you're going to be devoured. You're going to die. You're not going to have life more abundant. If I didn't go the way that I'm going now, if I didn't follow the conviction that is in my heart, I would be dead already. Now, we all face death, but if we face it with the giver of life, we may live again. If we go without him, out of his presence, and become that cauldron, that one purse that eats of its neighbor, covets its neighbor's goods, desires the flesh of its neighbor, grinds the bones of his neighbor for your personal benefit, then you will face death without God and the giver of life. You will be eating of the tree of knowledge. You will be self-righteous. You will be creating theologies and dogmas and doctrines and imposing them on other people. You need to face life with faith. What are the weightier matters? Everybody who listens to this broadcast should know by now the way to your matters according to Jesus is what? Law, justice, mercy, and faith. The, that local corruption, there, there are judges, I've seen this numerous times, judges and lawyers, many lawyers, 
use the system to steal property away from other people. I mean, it is blatant. It happens every day. It happens up in Prineville. It happens in Bend. It happened in Lapine. I can give you the cases. I can name you the people. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen the wounds these people have suffered. They usually go the family members were fighting over a piece of property instead of coming together. And one of them who was instigating this trouble ended up selling his pro the everything to a judge for a dollar because he ended up under the judge's thumb, probably made an agreement on the side that the judge would see to it that they were all free. They wouldn't go get any charges if he sells them the property for a dollar and the guy just agreed to it and did it. And now the judge is taking the property away from the rest of the family. And he's going to get away with it, probably, because people won't come together and follow according to the ways of Christ. And these, uh, I, I would love to be able to turn these things around and change these things, uh, but it's not only going to continue to happen as badly as it does uh, every day, it's, it's going to happen worse and worse and worse and worse if you don't start coming together. It, the momentum is there. There is no changing the course of history. You can only change your relationship to it. All of Christianity could not stop the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But it could carry a group through that decline and fall. Like the ark carried Noah. We are the planks of that ark. We are the boards and nails and pegs of that ark that will prove to the promised land. Everybody will become free and probably not too distant a future. But everybody will not survive freedom. Liberty comes with a price. And we don't have to kill sheep and burn them on piles of stone. But if we are living in accordance with the character of Christ and the character of the Father, we will be givers of life. 